I think we've got it finally, folks. I am so sorry. So composting basically is the decomposition, the breaking down of organic matter. With our systems, um, just make it simple if you'd like, or some people, they wanna get into all the technical details. That's fine also. Either approach will work. Um, and I really do encourage you to choose a system that will work for you. Think about how much time you are able or willing to spend in the composting efforts. Think about the physical effort um, that you can put into the system um, and also the materials that you have available. When you're thinking about the, the style of the, the composting pile, keep in mind that it's best to have about a cubic yard or larger of materials uh, of mass to decompose. If you have just a very, very small amount, what will happen is it will lose heat and moisture very rapidly and it will take longer to process. You will still get decomposition. It will just take longer. Also, take into account just how much space you have available. With a very small yard, um, you won't have as many choices, perhaps, as if you had a huge property to work within. Your composting system can just be a heap. Just, you know, throw things in and it wouldn't have any form to it per se. No matter what type of system you're going to work with, though, you should not have any bad odors. Uh, if you're concerned with tidiness and aesthetics, uh, you're probably going to want to have an enclosure instead of just the heat system. But no matter what, we should not have skunks falling over from the mal odors coming from our compost system. Let's look at some of the styles. Remember, we want to work with kind of, you know, general rule of thumb, a cubic yard. So some a kind of a container system that would be approximately three foot tall and wide um, would be best. For most of us, the maximum height that you'd want would be about three feet, um, unless you're one of those seven foot tall basketball players. But that would allow you ease of accessing the materials um, and working with the system. Now, some people might have their system in one place and that's where it will remain. And it may even be such that, um, you know, it's kind of structured so that you can't move it, you can't kind of tip it or anything. And if that's the case, I would recommend having some kind of removable panel or, or slats such as we see here or a removable um, kind of um, gate or something configuration like that. With this example, um, this is a front panel that was created mostly from fencing slats and um, two by fours holding those slats together. You can just latch it easily onto the structure itself and it's so easy to remove this and set it aside when you want to get into the material to work with. Um, now, these are nailed in place, so they're not removable slats, but these you can slide in and out of a system that they have developed here. Um, this one's really easy to see. Uh, this is a very large scale system that some years ago was at the Cooperative Extension Office, but they used these runners and I am horrible with construction terms, so I don't know what these little channels are called, but it, they built these wooden panels with handles, whoops, that would slide in and out very, very easily. So think about ease of the function also. Now, with our containers or bins, uh, they can range from being airtight, um, to, well, not totally airtight, 
but enclosed, not airtight, because the we need air in the system for the microorganisms to function. But we can have something very, very open to something more enclosed. And there are pros and cons to both types of systems. When we have the open system, you have better aeration, and we need that air for the micro organisms that are doing the work. With an enclosed system, you do have air, but it will be at a diminished amount. Open systems will dry out much faster, especially in the summer when we have 8% humidity. The enclosed will maintain moisture for an extended period of time. You will also lose heat from the system more quickly with the open system and the enclosed will hold heat better. This is a major thing to consider if you need to keep any type of animals from accessing the material, then you would certainly want an enclosed system. Um, so if you've got dogs that are, you know, curious and would want to try to, you know, jump in here and access things to munch on, um, or in some areas of the valley, you know, we have roof rats. With those situations, you'd want an enclosed system. Starting with some open examples, you can just use hardware cloth or chicken wire and just make a circle enclosure that is like about the easiest you can get. The I prefer hardware cloth because the scale of the openings is smaller. With chicken wire, um, as things are decomposing and getting smaller, they would tend to kind of, you know, fall out, sift out of the enclosure, but the open enclosure made with chicken wire or, you know, an, a wider grid, larger grid would be great for holding materials, what we would call stockpiling. This is a very elaborate, fancy system. Um, you know, another thing, you the expense. Um, you can find relatively inexpensive materials or you can go the route of something like this where you're investing more monetarily in the materials to build this. Um, you know, and it involved welding of these panels and um, these metal stakes and so forth, and they even capped it on the top so that nobody would get cut on the, the rough edges of this. Um, nice open system. They didn't put any enclosure on the front, so it's easily accessible to work. Um, just beautiful. This is actually in a community garden in Tempe. I want you to keep this in mind though, because I'm gonna refer back to this example a little bit later. Um, so just, you know, a wonderful structure. They've got it large enough. Um, I think it was actually about four foot wide and, as I say, easy to get in there and work with the materials. You could use recycled pallets. Uh, for those of you who like to reuse, repurpose, they can be configured in different manners. For our heap example, they just have these pallets, you know, kind of lined up, making a corner for this heap. They've made little units here in this example. And in this example, they used four pallets and made um, a square enclosed system. There are differences in pallets. The wood material that they're made from, some will decay more rapidly than other um, types of wood. And also um, the space between the slats could be an important concern. Now, um, the pallets that paint cans come on, um, I believe they have more narrow spaces between the slats. And you'll find some that, you know, if you're walking, trying to walk across it, if you're not careful, um, you, your foot could slide between the slats. There's so much space. So if that's the case and we want to hold the finer material as it breaks down more, you could use some screening inside of this and um, or this example, I think this was some old shade cloth that somebody repurposed and they lined the sides of this enclosure so that 
the smaller materials wouldn't just kind of fall out of that enclosure. You could build your enclosure, such as we see here. The, um, this one's a little fancier. They, they built it with the wood and actually painted it also. You can see there's a removable panel here. You can see oops, the um, hinges. Um, just be careful. Um, untreated wood over time will decompose itself because we want to keep the materials moist. Um, cedar or the redwood would be the slowest to decay. They are de definitely more resistant to decay. Be very, very careful with treated wood um, or even some painted wood, depending on what the paint is or the method of treatment. You don't want to have chemicals leach into your compost, especially if you're going to be using it for edibles, um, an edible garden, um, that would be a definite concern. Um, now, before, you know, historically, um, arsenic, um, copper, and chromium were used for treating the wood, and certainly arsenic is um, a heavy metal that can easily leach into your material with the consistent moisture. So just keep that in mind if you are going to be using wood uh, of different types. You can use straw bales. Eventually, they themselves will decompose and become part of your compost, but they're packed so densely that you should easily get at least a year or perhaps more out of an individual straw as a structural form for your as your enclosure. You can use cinder blocks. Here they have um, invested in new cinder blocks and somebody who's very handy built this um, one, two, three stage system that is just beautiful. They left gaps for air to um, get into the material also instead of making it just a solid wall you could reuse, repurpose. These were old cinder blocks, maybe um, pieces broken off that might have otherwise gone to the landfill. So it depends on the aesthetics that you prefer, the budget that you have and so forth. And um, that will help kind of steer the materials that you might use for your enclosure. These are plastic sheets, basically, with holes. This is actual the intent the actual intention of this system is for growing potatoes you would fill that with some nice loose beautifully organic um growing medium and plant your potatoes and it's so easy you just un um hook this un unfold it and you can just pull the potatoes out at the end of the season you don't have to worry about digging them up and then in the off season you could use this for composting. This is a beautiful system. It, it's kind of versatile. It is manufactured in such a way that you can have it be three foot diameter, or it can expand to be about five foot diameter. You have little um, kind of um, screw and, and nut systems that you can use to expand it or contract it, depending on how much material you might have to decompose at different times of the year. Our municipalities have our kind of recycled, repurposed trash bins that are available. And for the city of Chandler, um, when they have these available, you can go to the um, center and pick one up. They are, I believe, free of charge when they are available. You can take one, um, and I believe you could make arrangements for more than one um, if you contact um, Tracy, who uh, works with the city of Chandler. And I believe they're still not available with the town of Queen Creek. Um, but these can be great systems. Uh, with these, what happens, maybe a, a trash unit, um, a wheel broke off or, you know, cracked or something, 
instead of sending it to the landfill or to be recycled, um, the municipality will clean them up, will remove the wheels, and um, I think most of the municipalities remove the bottom of the system, and you can use them in you know different ways. You can use them with or without the lid. You can have it right side up, such as we see here, or upside down. And um, I had some friends. Now this wouldn't hold three, you know, a cubic yard. It's smaller, but a friend had some um, some youngsters, and they were each given their own compost system. So they were cut down even shorter, so that the boys could easily work the compost. Um, so these could be great systems to use. You could purchase um, commercial commercial recycled plastic bins. There are so many available. You can go on the internet and, and find an assortment. These all have basically a lid. They have on the sides some sort of system for aeration. This has slits um, along all the sides and a little door. A lot of them have a little door at the bottom for you to access materials from the base also. Um, this one has little slits. Um, vertical ones here, so this could be an option also. And I will mention, um, I've had one of, oh boy, sorry. I've had one of these that is, oh golly, it's over 20 years old, almost going on 25 years, that it's getting a little rickety, but it's still, you know, holding its form, still serving its function. Um, so don't be afraid of recycled plastic materials, even though our you know, situation here, um, our climate is so harsh. These will still last for many, many years. Um, for some people, it might be easier to use these tumblers that have an axis, a rod going through the center of them, and then it kind of tumbles around that um, center rod to mix the materials. Um, this is a little bit larger um, of this concept. And because it's so large, you know, it'd be hard to just kind of roll it um, manually. So it has a wheel system that and a crank. So you can use that to um, mix the, the organic matter that is inside and there are spaces for aeration there. So, so, you know, the possibilities of an enclosure of some sort are just, you know, almost endless, but please do not use pits for composting. Now there is a type of decomposition where you would dig into the soil, kind of bury organic matter and, you know, cover it back over and just let it decompose over time. Um, but that's not what we're talking about um, right now with our, our backyard composting. With pits, um, boy, you can get into some trouble. I had about a total of four inches of rain, this, you know, with the, the last four weeks. With that much rain, um, you might get an, an accumulation of water in the bottom of a pit, and that's when things get stinky. Um, you want to avoid that, so please just just don't use pits for your composting. Depending on the amount of space you have that you want to allot to your composting efforts, um, you could think about having even more than one section or, or you know one um, component, and with um, two compartments or even three, you could have a lot of versatility in your approach to um, you know, processing your materials. Um, this is just simple slats here. I thought this was pretty cool. Um, you know, especially if perhaps um, part of the year you're not going to be composting. Um, these are just held together with these metal rods. So you could pull these up and Gather up all your your slats, store them away for however long, and then easily um, reassemble that at, an, at a later time. And here they've got three 
um, section. So you could approach this having one section for fresh materials and another section for kind of, you know, newly started composting, then another one for material that's been um, well on its way to decomposing. Or another approach is you could um, kind of flip flop materials from one section to the, you know, back and forth to mix it. Um, so there are a lot of approaches that you could use. For the location of your system, the main thing is make sure it's easily accessible. Um, I think the more difficult things are in the life, the less apt we will be to do them. <laughs> and I think that compost follows right along in that kind of um, theory. So make sure that, um, you know, if you've got kitchen scraps or from your garden area that's going to be producing more mass to add to your compost, um, we want that system that we have to be um, easy to get to. And then also we want to have enough space to work the compost system. Um, this is in a friend's yard. They had a vegetable and herb garden along this section. And the back door would be kind of up in this area, just a little not too far off. So they had an easy route to get to their system. They built their own tumbler um, out of a big um, one of those big um, tubs. So easy access. This was in the back corner of the yard where I used to live. And this was great until I'm a plant nerd. So um, very small yard. I just, there were plants that I just had to have. And so I thought I would put a shrub next to this. I thought, oh, it'll kind of screen it, even though this is not bad looking. I thought, oh, it'll kind of camouflage it from the, you know, back patio or, you know, looking out from, you know, the kitchen or the, the dining room. And I knew how large that shrub would get. And certainly within just a couple of years, it got so large, it was hard to get to the compost bin. So that poor shrub had to go. And with this, I would not recommend this at all. Uh, we will get to the moisture later in a little while, but this is right up with this example here. It is right up against the wall of the house. Now, you know, basically we don't ever want to have a situation where we have consistent moisture near the foundation of our house, because what happens then? Uh, what do they say about termites around here? It's not if you get them, it's when do you get them? We don't want to encourage termite activity. So this is um, one I would not recommend locating your compost bin. We want it accessible, but don't put it right up against your house structure. This is in the background here, an enclosed vegetable garden. Um, some friends lived where there were so many different critters, um, you know, winged critters, four-legged and so forth, that they just built an enclosure for their vegetable garden. This was right outside that area. So very easy when they were clearing out beds or, you know, had excess harvest or whatever, they could throw this right in here. And also it was an easy route from their kitchen to use kitchen scraps. The really important thing to remember is you have to have easy access to water. Your compost system will need moisture. And if you know you don't have an easy means of getting water to the system, it's just not going to work. Um, you know, kids, the the hauling water in buckets that wears off. <laughs> the the kind of intrigue or interest in that wears off very quickly. So make sure that. Um, you've got a hose that can easily reach it or, or some way to get water to the material because, <clears throat> pardon me, um, if not, your materials will dry out and that will take much longer for decomposition to occur. Remember that fancy welded um, system at the community garden? Beautiful, 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 um, great location for it, except 
we had to connect three garden hoses to get water to that compost system. So, do you know, you can imagine how often that occurred that somebody would, you know, grab three different hoses, hook them up and and water, you know, get water to that system. So it didn't work. Um, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you do have an, a more open system, such as this, you might want to have um, some distance away from any kind of wall. Um, these are, you know, painted stucco walls in the background here. Um, and with this open system, a hard rain that we have with our monsoons, that could splash material onto the wall that, you know, might discolor the wall if that's a concern for you. With this enclosed system, you know, it's not going to splash um, and potentially discolor the wall there. Also, it's best if you have a level, well-drained surface. It doesn't have to be a hard surface such as this, they use some um, pavers here underneath this, so it can drain easily. And here um, they had repurposed some old fence slats and just put that in the bottom. So it was easy to um, you know, turn the material without you know, getting um, you know, dirt from below mixed in with it, which wouldn't be a really bad thing, but it just made, especially with the final compost, made it a lot easier to get out of there, a lot cleaner. Um, so avoid, we, we don't want to compost in pits and you also don't want to have your compost system at a really low point. If you have a sloped terrain in your yard, again, you don't want water accumulating there. Definitely try to avoid um, large trees or shrubs being in the vicinity, because even if it's the most drought tolerant desert tree, maybe it's an ironwood tree. Just because it's drought tolerant does not mean that it won't suck up all the water it has access to. Um, that can be a great problem. You could end up with roots growing into your compost if you don't turn it frequently, which could just be kind of an annoyance. Uh, but the main thing is that is not healthy for your trees. Um, they should not be um, in proximity of consistent moisture. So try to locate your system. If you've got enough room, locate it away from the root systems of trees or, or big shrubs. Well, do you go with sun or shade? I'd say that's not a real critical thing to um, kind of go by as far as where to locate your system. In the summer, if your system is in the sun, Yes, it will dry out more quickly. In the winter, being in a real sunny area might help hold heat longer and keep the system more active. Um, but overall, these are, you know, not big um, situations that would be, you know, real high on the list when you decide where to locate your system. Um, you know, thinking of aesthetics, I'd say if you have some kind of an enclosure, aesthetics wouldn't be like a huge concern, but this was an, a very large yard. And this is my friend who had the young boys that were composting. And here's their patio where they, you know, have friends hang out, um, you know, and have barbecues or whatever. And even though it's pretty close, it's it's all contained, so it wasn't any kind of unsightly situation that would kind of put anybody off who wasn't a gardener. And this one I thought was really cute. They used some picket fence. The in this situation, the house and back patio were over here, and this wasn't you know bad to look at at all. This enclosure here, but they just wanted to kind of fancy it up and maybe be a little whimsical. And so they just put this little fence around it. Now the process for your compost product, you will need to think of your composting as a living thing. So you will need to provide food, water, and air. If you have these components, then the workers will come. 
And these would be primarily what we would um, consider our microorganisms. And with our food, we have two basic categories, the carbon and the nitrogen. Some re references you could come across might vary greatly. I use the ratio of at least three parts carbon to one part nitrogen would be a really you know, good combination of material. Um, I, there are some references that you will see that recommend 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. I'd say if you've got some of both, you will end up with a finished product. Uh, it might, your ratio might affect the speed of the decomposition a little, but as long as you've got all of those, the food, water, and air, you should be in good shape. We're gonna look at the carbon materials first. These are generally the dry materials, dry leafy materials, woody materials, things that are, are dead. So a good example, um, if you gather up some dried leaves, they can be stockpiled and used as a great source of carbon. You could use dried winter ryegrass clippings. I recommend that if you're going to be using your compost for anything other than turf, and especially if you're going to be using it in a flower bed or a vegetable garden, I would just overall steer clear of Bermuda grass. That can be a nightmare. If any of you have ever tried to remove Bermuda grass from an area, you will understand why I'm just like so paranoid and so against Bermuda grass and the, the composting system. Rye grass, yeah, it's, it's very friendly overall. So the dried clippings of your rye grass, th that would be a source of carbon. And the straw, just be careful with, I'd say with all of your materials, if they're not coming from you, yourself, um, your environment, you, you know, your activity, check out the, the source. Um, because with some straw, you might be getting a lot of Bermuda grass in that. And if there is Bermuda grass seed in there, you're going to be having seed germinate in your system. You could also use chipped or shredded tree material. And if you don't have a lot of carbon material, um, you know, if you see a landscape business on, on the street as you're driving by, Stop if they've got a chipper. Stop and say, hey, could you drop a load at my house? And most likely they will be thrilled because that means they don't have to spend the time going to a landfill um, or someplace to get rid of this. So this is what you'd be getting. And it's a great source. And if it, you know, most likely they will drop an entire load. But don't be afraid of that. Um, you could share it with some friends or this can just be great material to use as a top mulch anywhere in your landscape, as well as in your compost bin. You could also use wood shavings, again, because of potential um, leaching of some toxic materials, I'd say steer away from treated wood shavings. Coffee filters. Now, they're also a good source of carbon. And none of these materials are gonna be 100% carbon or 100% nitrogen. It's just what is the, the biggest um, you know, percentage of the composition. Tea bags also, and shredded newspapers, shredded up paper bags, shredded, you know, broken apart, oops, Cardboard egg cartons could also be used. These days we have options of a lot of um, eating ware that could potentially be composted. Things that are made out of um, bamboo or corn, um, palm, all of these things. Now, overall, these are more so intended for commercial composting that is going to be definitely at uh, probably a higher temperature than what we would have in our backyards. 
and, and so forth. Um, but you could still throw these into your own system. It's just gonna take a long time for them to break down. We have cups that instead of being plastic that are um, in some areas perhaps still recyclable with that triangular symbol. If you see this round symbol, that indicates that it's compostable or biodegradable. Um, I thought this was so cute. This was at a restaurant and they're saving the planet one burrito at a time. They had their burritos wrapped in unbleached compostable paper and um, for some of their materials, they were serving on compostable um, plates. So you clean any food off of these and put them into your compost bin and utensils. As I say, again, these would take a really long time to break down, but you could throw them into your system. Um, this is a one of those soup mixes where you just add the water and you know, um, hot water and let it sit, and then you've got your soup. This um, I tried one of these, and I think after six months, it was in this condition, you know, not really breaking down, but it was actually decomposing. It was like eggshell thin by that time. Um, so it just, you know, might take a year or more for some of these things. And plastic bags, these are overall still more expensive than plastic, um, but some businesses are using these. I found these at Trader Joe's. So this is, you know, the grocery bag itself. And at Trader Joe's, they had um, the um, produce bags were, were compostable. So those are carbon sources, the dried brown materials. Nitrogen sources are gonna be the wet, moist, you know, green things. Definitely kitchen scraps from vegetables and fruits can be added to our compost. They're a great source of nitrogen. I just wanna caution you, like if you're making a stir fry, um, the ends of the zucchini or you know, the squash that you cut off, they go into the compost, not the leftovers that you might have added a little bit of oil to or some other, you know, salt um, and so forth. That, I for your just basic backyard compost, and you don't add that, but these fresh things. And also, um, you know, from, from fruits, um, if you, again, aren't, you don't feel like you have enough material, um, get to be friendly with somebody at a juice bar. I'm sure they would, you know, take them a five gallon bucket and say, hey, I'll stop by in a couple hours. I bet they would be happy to fill that for you and send that material home with you. Same with coffee grounds. That coffee filter or the tea bags were a good source of carbon. What's inside the used coffee grounds or the used tea could be a good source of nitrogen. Same thing. Oh, you're not a coffee drinker. Well, a lot of businesses will refill the bags that their um, beans, coffee beans come in and they'll load those back up with the, the brood, the remain brood grounds of the coffee. And I know a lot of them, um, they might have, you know, a basket or a bucket even near the door where you can just you know, grab one or a couple and take those with you. Or perhaps you could, you know, drop off a five gallon bucket with them. And fresh winter ryegrass clippings would be more so a source of nitrogen. Dried, source of carbon. Fresh cut, that's a source of nitrogen. And definitely I would just steer away from the living Bermuda grass. Um, Bermuda spreads by runners above ground and below ground. If you have any of those or any seed in there, um, that can just be you know, planted when you're working with your vegetable garden. So avoid that. Young weeds are great. And you know, get the weeds when they're young, they're easier to pull from your yard and the perfect like gourmet greens for your compost. The um, you know, if you're clipping back things in your garden or your, your landscape, those can go in. Or maybe, you know, the zucchini that was hidden and, you know, is two foot long now, um, you're not going to want to eat that. Or these eggplant that were hidden and, you know, they're way past their prime. 
you can cut those up and throw them in as a great nitrogen source. Even hair, pet hair, human hair can be a wonderful source of nitrogen and manure. Now, manure is a little complicated. You can use manure of vegetarians. So animals that don't eat meat products. Um, the exception would be kind of chickens. They kind of eat anything and everything. Um, but cows, horses, goats, sheep, chickens. Again, I would recommend know the source. Sometimes cow manure can be so heavy in salts, depending on the time of the year. Um, horses, they might be grazing in a Bermuda pasture. There again, that scares me. <laughs> um, but these are possibilities. Do not add the, the feces, um, the excrement from domestic, you know, your cats or dogs or domestic birds. Uh, these can carry pathogens. They can carry parasites even um, that you do not want to potentially have trickle down into your vegetable garden. Um, if you're processing composting to real high temperature, um, these things could be kind of killed off, but definitely with um, pathogens, I would not want to risk it. So you, with your compost, you wanna make sure it's fully, and with your manure, make sure it's fully decomposed before you add it into a vegetable or herb garden. And that should make, that should ensure that the pathogens potentially um, salmonella or listeria or E. coli, um, that should um, you know, help ensure that those things um, aren't still active. The also, <clears throat> pardon me, the manure, if it's not fully decomposed, it could, with high concentration of salts that can burn the roots of your plants. Now, you might hear or you, you know, might have come across um, that you need to layer the, the brown and green materials. Well, you know, that would be like having all of your food separated on your plant. It's all gonna end up in the same place. It's all gonna get mixed. So layering can help you better envision or control the ratio of the materials you're putting in but it's not necessary um, because it will get mixed definitely um, as the materials are processed. But if you have a lot of fresh food scraps, you might want to make sure that you cover them with some carbon materials to kind of um, camouflage them from critters that might be interested in those fresh materials. I would recommend that you don't add any diseased or insect infested plant materials to your compost. Do not add any fish, meat, bones, or dairy products. These can attract nasty flies and you know, fats and oils, they can become in no time, become rancid and just smell horrible. Weed seeds. Now, if you are certain that you're going to get your compost up to 150 degrees, a lot of the weed seeds will be killed, um, but I'd still just say, just don't add the weed seeds. Um, ashes, now I grew up gardening in Michigan. Ashes were great, but we don't wanna add ash to our compost here. We have alkaline soil and um, you know, lime. Also, we don't want to be um, adding materials that would kind of magnify um, or, you know, create a higher pH in our soil down the line and eggshells. And you can throw in a couple eggshells now and then, but if you're running a bed and breakfast where you're going through two dozen eggs a day, don't add all those eggs. <laughs> um, you know, eggshells are made of calcium. And if anybody has ever battled caliche in their yard, which is a form of calcium carbonate, we don't want to be making more caliche for gardeners, you know, a few thousand years down the line. I always want to be thinking about those gardeners in the future. And definitely no feces from cats or dogs. If you have magazines or those slick colored pages for ads in the newspaper, don't add those. 
they are just full of hydrocarbons. Um, so if you have weeds that don't have flowers or seed, um, you know, seed, definitely I would not add this. Um, flowers, even if they're, you know, past their prime and on the way to becoming seed, I wouldn't add those. I'd snap their little flower heads off and throw those in the garbage. And um, you can still add the rest of the weed to your compost though. And tumbleweeds, you might think, oh, oh, look at that, great source of carbon. Well, yeah, but also a great source of a thousand new tumbleweeds <laughs> uh, loaded with seeds, I would imagine. So avoid things like that, I would recommend. Um, now, there are some plants such as oleander that have toxins, you know, every part of an oleander is toxic. Um, and there are studies by the university that prove that if fully decomposed, toxins or growth inhibitors from eucalyptus and tamarisk, sunflowers and so forth, they will be broken down into inert materials. I'm, you know, always, I'd like to avoid problems. So I wouldn't use these for a vegetable garden myself. But as I say, um, university studies show that if the material is fully decomposed, those toxins or growth inhibitors are broken down into inert ingredients. Um, perhaps if, you know, if I were gonna be using my compost just out in my landscape, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But, you know, if it's gonna be something that I eat, my personal opinion is I would steer away from this. So that's up to you how we, you would like to handle that um, personally. And if you like to be an, an organic purist, uh, make sure any, you know, spent wilted flower arrangements, uh, make sure they are organic because our traditional flower arrangements, um, those flowers have been pumped with synthetic fertilizers. They might have even been um, sprayed with, you know, different in pesticides, insecticides and so forth, or maybe even sprayed with some kind of chemical to make them the flowers last longer. So with organic flower arrangements, you know, that shouldn't be a problem at all. And, you know, grass clippings. Um, if they're not your own, did, you know, where your source, did they use synthetic fertilizers and these other materials? Um, you could use pet bedding, but some bedding might have been treated with chemicals to prevent fleas and ticks. Um, newspapers with soy ink, that's great, that's organic, um, but re our regular printing ink um, does have hydrocarbons. But overall, um, just regular printed newspaper wouldn't be such a high quantity that it would be harmful. But if you were um, wanting to be fully organic, you'd stick to printed materials um, that use the soy ink. And again, you know, you'd be using the um, unbleached coffee filters and untreated wood. So that's the food, the carbon, the nitrogen. Remember, you just have to have both. Don't get too hung up on the ratio. The water that you want to keep your the the organic material in your system. You want to keep it moist, like a wrung out sponge. That's the kind of usual typical analogy. You don't want it if you grab a bunch of the material and squeeze it. You don't want water to drip out. If the pile is too wet, that is when you get bad odors. And if this does happen, um, just add more carbon material and mix the materials, um, but you do wanna keep it moist. Um, I just, I couldn't resist, I'm an evil person. Um, when I worked at the Botanical Garden, this was one of my volunteers, we had just, we had this huge pile of compost and it had to be kept moist until it was used. So he was trying to moisten it and finally he just, you know, decided the easiest thing to do is just climb up on top there and water it. Now, I am such a lazy gardener that I don't drag the hose over to my compost pile. So I devised a connection to my shrub, my desert shrub irrigation line. 
So every time my desert shrubs get watered, my compost gets at least a little bit of water. So this is hanging over the top of my compost system and just sprays um, when my shrubs get watered. So maybe not the best, but at least it's getting periodic moisture. So keep, keep the material moist and the air. We have microorganisms that are breaking down the organic matter. They have to have air just like we do. So that means you want to turn the material, mix it up frequently, ideally um, do this at least once a week. You could even do it twice a week, but I wouldn't suggest more often. If you're one of those, it's like, you know, more is better. Um, if once a week is good, you might think every day would be great. No, because what you'll be doing is you'll be losing more, um, you'll be losing um, heat from the system. And that's what helps it kind of decompose more rapidly. So, you know, moderation, <laughs> don't go overboard. Um, but you do want to mix the materials or somehow get air into the material. The smaller the material gets, you know, as it decomposes, um, you're probably going to want to have different gardening um, tools to mix it. So this is if you're going to be mixing it manually. I would say to start with, have a pitchfork because you've got big chunks of material and this, you know, a shovel, you're not going to be able to get the shovel through that. And with a pitchfork, you can dig in there, mix it up, turn it, and very easily get air to the materials. Um, if you've got um, a digging fork, that could also be used. And then as materials get smaller and smaller, you could change over to using a shovel. Because when they get smaller and smaller, the pitchfork isn't going to be very effective at turning the material. Now, if you don't or can't physically mix it with these, you know, shovels and so forth, um, just to get some air into the system, you could use other means. You could have um, some big PVC tubes with holes. Um, kind of staggered, or at least one in the middle of the material, but I would recommend even a few of them. And also, um, this is what you can buy off the shelf. I would go a step further and put a lot more holes in this. So this sits down with the material around it, and you have this tube that air is traveling down and can get a little bit of air to the materials themselves. There are gizmos you can purchase. Um, this is a, a winged aerator. You push this down into your system, and as it's pushing down, these wings, they kind of, you know, are pushed back on the rod. You push it down all the way and then pull up. And as you're doing so, those wings release and kind of um, pull some of the material loose as it moves through. So it's not really mixing the material, but it's loosening it. Same thing with this compost crank. I love these. Um, it's like a giant corkscrew. So you would um, kind of, you know, like you would a corkscrew, you'd push it down into the material and then pull up. So it doesn't mix the material, but it loosens it to get a little bit more air to um, the ends, the, you know, middle materials. And you can see it, it looks just like a giant corkscrew. So, and this system, it's a two bin system, and they had between the two sides, four by fours and this um, hardware cloth, you had this four inch opening between the two halves to give air. And with our um, containers here, as I mentioned before, they have some kind of slat or openings to allow air in. If you need more air, um, make the, the lid a jar or even take it off. Here in this garden, they just used some old shade cloth and shoved it in between the materials so a little more air could get in. Just something to make sure that the workers, the microorganisms are being, and you'll have access to enough air for them to work. Now, you might think that you've got to get fancy starters or um, activators, 
you could work with these, but they're not necessary. Um, might be kind of fun to play around with, but it's not necessary to get your compost going. You could, oops, sorry. You could just take a shovel full of, you know, rich garden soil that you already have or a friend has. Um, just one shovel full probably would be sufficient and sprinkle that in through your system and mix it with the materials or even just our desert soil. Now, it won't contain as many microorganisms as some already organically rich matter, but it still has the same microorganisms that will start breaking the materials down. And this is what we want to see. We want to see things get fuzzy and green or pink and red or black. That means that the microorganisms will have fungi and bacteria and actinomycetes that are little microscopic things that are working to break these materials down. And don't freak out if you see something like this, or maybe something that looks ash-like in your, your compost. Um, this, these are what we call the mycelial mass of different types of fungus that are helping to break down um, woody materials, especially woody materials that go into your compost. That's a really good sign when you see something like that. So thank you, T. I just I just wanted to let you know it's seven twelve. All right. Yeah, we're we're winding up here. Thank you. So we have um, with our bacteria. There are both um, bacteria that need air, and these are the ones we want to promote um, their activity. They're aerobic bacteria, and then there are anaerobic that don't need the air, and they're the ones that make things stinky. So with our aerobic. Um, with our good working compost piles, you'll have different types or different species of bacteria as the temperature and um, the maturing or decomposition occurs. And so, yeah, I mean, this isn't something you really have to, you know, remember at all, but just so you know, there are going to be different microorganisms working for you at different temperatures. You can see this temperature range. This is important. We want our um, our activity to get to really heat things up to get the fastest decomposition. Getting the fastest decomposition is aided by having small material go into your pile. If you've got things like this that you just clip from your garden, if you take the time to clip these and, you know, two or three inch pieces, that gives a bigger surface area for the micro organisms to work on and they can get their work done faster. So if you have vegetables, don't throw in, you know, an old onion or a whole potato, at least slice them up a little bit. Definitely don't, you know, throw in whole vegetables like this, chop them up and decomposition will occur much more rapidly. The greater the surface area, the faster the decomposition. If you've got a lot of yard material, you might want to invest in a little shredder. There are some different types that are really easy to use and um, can be very, make easy work of shredding up and making things smaller, um, small branches, leaves, and so forth. Um, this is a little bit larger system. And I thought this was so cool. I saw this on a garden tour and if you, you trust your neighbors, your gardening friends, you might go in, pool your money and invest in something um, a little more heavy duty like this, as long as you, you know, are sure that everybody's gonna maintain it, use it carefully um, so that it's always, you know, in good shape when you need to use it. This could be a really neat thing to share um, some equipment like this. Now, we also have macroorganisms, bigger organisms, that we can see with our eyes, things like roly polies and um, pill bugs. You might even find some grubs, um, or you might even spot some roaches or crickets in there. That is not a bad thing. They make things smaller so that those microorganisms, again, can break things down more rapidly. If you are getting your compost, heated to a nice high temperature, like 140, 150 degrees or so, that will kill the eggs 
and a lot of weed seed, eggs of perhaps undesirables like crickets and roaches. So yeah, you've got some in the compost pile, um, but you're not gonna be having huge explosions of these insects if you make sure that you're heating up so that any egg cases that they laid would be killed off. And personally, we've got roaches and crickets everywhere in our desert yards. And I would much rather have them focusing on my compost bin, the back of the you know, corner of the yard, than trying to get into my house. If you really want to get into it, and I really would suggest this is a fun thing, um, and you don't have to be too much of a techie, but I would suggest this. With a compost thermometer, it has a rod, looks like a, a meat thermometer, but it has a rod that's about um, two feet in length. You push that down into the material. And you will see as decomposition occurs, you're going to get higher and higher temperatures. And when you start getting 120, 30, 40, even up to 150, you know, things are really working well. If all of a sudden temperature drops from one day, or, you know, if you check it every other day, drops rapidly, that could mean that the microorganisms don't have enough air. And that would necessitate, you know, getting some, you know, type of tool out and mixing the material if you see those rapid drops. So you're you're gonna have kind of a, like a bell curve where the temperature gets higher, higher, higher until you get up to 100, you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees. And then the temperature will slowly decline. And that's what you're finding as the process um, is completed, that the temperature will slow will gradually lower. So you know Try to stockpile enough material to have a good, you know, about a cubic yard to start with. And then, you know, having backup to keep processing through time also. And you can have a heap or you might be more discreet and have it in closed containers. Um, and then, you know, it's ready to chop up or chip if you've got a, a shredder. And from stockpiling to processing to our finished compost, you don't have to put a sign in there. That was on a garden tour also. Um, but this is what we wanna find, what we wanna use. Our finished material, we shouldn't be able to really recognize anything that went in. That's when you know it's sufficiently decomposed. You can lose um, you can start with a huge mass, you know, a cubic yard, and maybe end up with only, um, you know, a quarter of that, or maybe anywhere from a quarter to a half of that mass by the time it's fully decomposed and ready to go into your garden. And if you do have some bigger chunks, you could screen, you could sift it, and um, pieces that were bigger, not fully decomposed, you can throw back in. This is a neat sifter. On a frame here, you just shake it back and forth. Um, or these folks are doing kind of with between themselves doing a similar activity here. So if you're really, really speeding things up, you might get something, you know, in, in a, about a month or two, but most often we're going to have, if we're very diligent about keeping the material moist and turning it, you know, once a week or twice a week. Probably it's going to take about four to six months to get finished compost. Certainly materials that are very fibrous, um, such as, you know, pine needles or agave leaf fibers or corn cobs, they will take much longer to decompose. That's okay. Just keep throwing them back in. Let them have more time to decompose. And for our vegetable and traditional herb gardens, this compost or, you know, um, annual flower beds. This is a really um, necessary component to add to our desert soil. Um, mix this in, uh, you can, almost can't add too much compost to our soil for growing these materials. And this just provides so many benefits. It makes the soil um, more loose for if we've got a clay soil of fine particles loosens the soil so you've got better aer aeration and the water moves through it more easily. And, you know, there are areas um, of the valley that have kind of a sandy soil. So adding a lot of compost will, you know, do the reverse. It'll slow the movement of the water down 
and um, you still got great aeration. So it just really helps all around. And when we're watering, um, no matter what type of soil we're starting with for our vegetable garden, when we have loaded it up with compost mixed with the soil, um, our wetting pattern is going to be about as deep as it is wide. So that's kind of a nice thing to know to um, you know, visualize how that water is moving through the soil to help guide you and how often to water. <clears throat> Over time, the addition of compost will help um, bring the pH of our soil. Um, most of us have a pH even close to eight or perhaps above. It'll help buffer the pH and bring it closer to neutral, which will make some critical um, nutrients more easily absorbable by our vegetables and flowers. So this means we don't, we, we'll still have to fertilize, but we don't have to fertilize as often when we're using the compost in this way. So the microorganisms, um, they just, you know, we want to keep them alive. They help create a healthy soil for our plants to grow in. And certainly there are bad bacteria and fungi and these good microorganisms that are carried um, through the process of our, our decomposition and then added to our gardens, they help kind of battle the bad um, bacteria and things. And you might find in your vegetable garden when you've loaded it up with combos, you might find things like this. Don't be afraid. This will not harm your plants. There are just fungi that are, you know, more completely decomposing that compost. So I do want to thank you for joining us. And for the, the compost, I do want to make, make it clear. Um, this is a great soil amendment for vegetables and traditional herbs like basil and mint and so forth. But for our desert landscape plants, do not mix compost in with your, your backfill soil when you're planting desert plants, desert adapted plants. What you want to do with them is use that compost as a top mulch around the root system of your plants. That will just make them so, so vigorous because it's going to help hold the moisture in the soil and um, just over time it will decompose a little bit more and eventually work into the soil but please don't mix it into the backfill. So do we have any questions? We do. Um, we have a question about lint from the dryer. I think it came right after yes. you were talking about adding hair and things like that into yeah. the compost. I would, would um, my recommendation is if you, we're drying a load of things that were all cotton. I would say sure. But if you've got polyesters, you know, things like that, um, I would not add those to my compost because they're not going to necessarily break down. Okay, great. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up here? Yeah, that was a good question. You know, any yeah. that that we can avoid sending to the landfill. Um, so, if, if you know, if you've had cotton towels or cotton sheets or you know cotton clothes that you just washed and they went through the dryer, I'd say definitely add that to to your compost. Sure. Let's see. Okay. Um, can I pick a mushroom and add it? I think they mean like maybe add it to your compost. Yes, sure. Add yeah, keep that cycle going. <laughs> <laughs> I would say most of the the shrooms, most of the mushrooms, the fungus that we would have popping up in you know working on our compost, you know um, the organic matter that we add to our vegetable or herb garden. Um, I would say. Probably 99.9% .9 of those are not edible, but we can certainly throw them, you know, into the compost bin. Sure. Yeah. And then what about rabbit or tortoise feces? Okay. Now, if you know 
that if they haven't been eating Bermuda grass, I would say yes. I am just so paranoid. Um, I've I've battled Bermuda grass enough um, to know that it can just be so frustrating. And you know, if you've got a nice vegetable garden, you don't want to have Bermuda grass popping up in it. Um, so if you're confident that um, they haven't been eating Bermuda, I'd say definitely add that. And in fact, you know, unfortunately, not being in person, I don't have all my props with me, but usually I, I show some some rabbit droppings and, and they were from bunnies at the Desert Botanical Garden that I knew had no access to um, Bermuda grass. So those I would say definitely. Okay, awesome. I'm not seeing any more um, questions in the chat. So. Thank you, Kurti. That was an amazing presentation. And thank you everyone who attended our workshop today. Um, on this slide, you'll find our uh, the websites for the city of Chandler and the town of Queen Creek, as well as more resources along with our contact information. Um, if you have more questions about the workshops or just, um, you know, composting in general, feel free to reach us there.